Hello everyone, this is Andrew Pledger, and I wanted to talk to you for a little bit today about an incredible nonprofit called Courage365. This is an organization that is created by survivors and it's for survivors. Courage365 empowers survivors of abuse to live with courage every day. I personally know the founder and CEO of Courage365, Ashley Easter, and she has an incredible passion and love for survivors because she survived a cult and wanted to create an organization to help other survivors. What I love the most about Courage365 are the incredible free resources they provide. So please go check out their website, courage365.org, and I'll also have it linked in the show notes, but I highly recommend checking out this incredible organization. Now enjoy this episode of Beyond BJU. This is Beyond BJU, Exposing Fundamentalism. I'm your host, Andrew Pledger, and I'm a survivor of Bob Jones University. BJU is a fundamentalist college with its roots in white supremacy and is known for its culture of indoctrination, conformity, and control. Its influence extends beyond its campus, impacting Christian schooling, politics, biblical counseling, and evangelical Christianity. The school serves as a hub for churches, schools, and camps, and these institutions perpetrate its abusive teachings and practices. This show explores these areas of influence and amplifies the stories of those who have been impacted by Bob Jones University. This is Beyond BJU, Exposing Fundamentalism. Hello everyone, this is Andrew Pledger. And I am really excited for you to hear the second episode of Beyond BJU, Exposing Fundamentalism. And this episode really focuses on the theology, teachings, and heresies of Bob Jones University. And this is something I did not get to cover a lot of in the Surviving BJU podcast. I did a quick overview of what they said on their website, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to go to the person who has really studied BJU's teachings and was under their teachings and has also studied religion. And yes, I am having back on Dr. Camille Lewis. And I learned a lot from this episode, and it gave me a lot to think about just through my own upbringing in the independent fundamental Baptist movement, and even of my time at Bob Jones University. And it made me realize, you know, a lot of us, when we get out of these high control religious groups or religious cults, we come out with that black and white mindset. I definitely saw that in myself when I I left fundamentalism a couple of years ago, and I've definitely seen that some in different deconstructing slash atheist communities online where they only interpret it one way and only see it one way and don't even understand that it can be open to many different interpretations or approaches or belief. Um, and I think this we need to have that openness and not have that black and white mindset about it. But she really, uh, I think this episode is really going to help a lot of people just, I know some people don't like the word deconstruct, but untangle is a better word, or disentangle, as the Duggars like to say, disentangle 
um, the beliefs you were raised in and question that and really realize, oh, maybe some of these things are not based in freedom and love. But I think you're really going to enjoy this episode of Beyond BJU. Enjoy. Hello, I am so happy to have Dr. Camille Lewis back. And I'm not going to ask you to introduce yourself because right. you have done it several times. Like, you're going to be a regular guest on oh, this podcast. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, I enjoy talking to you always. So thank you for including me. Oh, of course. I love our conversations. I love the work uh, that you've done. And all of this wouldn't be possible without you. And I want to always make sure like, to give you credit because like That's you, kind. yes, you've done so much work with your blog in your research and just really pushing through with all of it and all the hate that you get. Yeah. For thank you. you. Thank you for recognizing it. It's not, yeah. it's not fun. No, you know that you get it, <laughs> but you've been dealing with it a lot. Yeah. And it pops. It's what's weird is that it pops up at times that you don't expect it. Yeah. I'm thinking about a recent incident where Ooh. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know you would, you felt that way, but now I know, I guess I've been warned. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, but thank you for all that you do. And in this episode, I really wanted to dig into the teachings and theology of Bob Jones University because it's something we didn't really get to dig into deeply in the Surviving BJU sure. podcast. I did a quick overview of what they claim to teach, right. just trusting their website, just doing an overview of what it claims to but something I want to dig into. So for the first question I have, what are the core beliefs and doctrines of Bob Jones University? And they list these online, but what are they not being transparent about or honest about their teachings and theology? The creed itself tells you a lot. I'll be just blunt. It starts with, I believe in the inspiration of the Bible. That's an odd thing to start with. The historic creeds of the Christian faith always start with God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That's how you start. You start with God. God's the start. The Nicene Creed, that was the Apostles' Creed. The Nicene Creed starts with or, or emphasizes Christ's divinity. That God is, is God of God. He is absolutely God. Not that he derived from God, but that he is God. But BJ starts with the Bible. That's a telling thing. And even if you look a little deeper, to be a uh, rhetorician for a second, if you look at the BJU Creed, there's only one verb in there. There's two save men from sin, but that's still an in, in infinitive. But it's, the, and the only person doing any action is me. I believe. God's actions are completed. It, it doesn't start with God. It starts with the Bible, and it's all on me, which is an encapsulation of BJU. The Trinity for BJU is not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's God the Father, who's somewhat detached, the Bible, and me. It puts, uh, Those are the, th the three actors, if they're in there at all, and in Bob Jones University's theology. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, because that, when I remember saying the creed every week, and I just didn't question it for the longest time. Sure. Because you're like, they're purposely doing this in repetition to make you accept it without question. Really participating in this group ritual mm -hmm. to do this. And if and you think it's, you think it's, you say, uh, 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 an evangelical friend or even a mainline liberal Protestant friend will say, we say creeds. I remember talking to John Matsko about the BJU creed, John Matsko the longstanding archivist, the longstanding history faculty. He was my teacher for History of Civ. And I said this, I said what I'm, to him, what I'm saying right now, that this is an odd creed. In the light of the church, this is an odd creed because it starts with the Bible. And he shrugged it off and said, all creeds are political. And I thought, wow, that is a very cynical and secular perspective on creeds mm. because that's not what when you when i say because i i i am still a christian 
I affirm often in church, the Apostles' Creed. Sometimes we do the Nicene Creed. But when I affirm that, it's a reminder of God's character, of God's care, but not in the BJU Creed. It's a reminder of, it, it's, ideal, it's idolizing the Bible. It's making the Bible into an idolatrous thing. And that's risky for me to say, but that is what it's bibliolatry is what some people call it. Mm. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, that's a little bit. It's a people don't like that at all, but it yeah. is. It's making the Bible into an idol. And it's interesting though, because then there's a whole interpretation of the Bible too. There's a and whole... it's like a weapon, right? Yeah. I've got the Bible's mine, and you all are wrong. Um. Yes. It's a and... weapon. And it's interesting because in religious groups or religious cults, when you make something sacred, you then cannot question that. So when you, Bill Gothard, who pushed teachings and claimed it was from God, but people actually deconstructed it. Oh, no, he's twisting scripture. He's manipulating. This isn't from God. He, what, what is it called? Proof texting. He's doing a lot of mm -hmm. proof texting. And then those books that he writes, those weird books are sacred like you're saying they're untouchable yeah. they're just untouchable. like changed into his image is untouchable oh yeah jim Berg. oh yeah you cannot oh well, because when i questioned that because he said something in there that was heresy he's adapted it a little bit in the second edition but he said i think it's page 36 he said every christian has within him a clone of satan's own nature and it violently opposes God. That is not the Bible. There is nowhere does anybody teach that anybody has a clone or, or, or is made, we could use the other term the, that uh, evangelicals use, that is we are made in the image of Satan. That is nowhere. That is nowhere, but it is a very uh, Manichaean is the technical term, philosophy. Anyway, it's not Bible. And okay. if you tell that to Jim Berg, that this is wrong, he gets very upset with you. All right. <laughs> Ask me how I know. That happened at the Atlanta Bread Company over there in Cherrydale. He was very upset about that. Oh, ooh. I know. Because I remember you talking about that before, and I bought the latest edition of his book, which oh. PNR P Press has put shame on. Them. Oh, you bought the the PNR version. I, I bought his. Yes, I'm, I'm. I know people are like, you bought his book, and I'm like, yeah, because oh, no, that's okay. I'm going to deconstruct it on this show, so that's okay. yeah. we're gonna. And yeah, good for you. Anyways, and I purposely I looked to see. It. If he like changed that phrase or not, yeah. because he is, and you've given him crap about it, and hopefully other people have, <laughs> right. as, as you should, as yeah. you should, and he changed it to reflection of Satan's nature instead of clone. In his newest edition, reflection. That doesn't really seem to be any more accurate. I mean, yeah, that's not in there. That's not in there. And that kind of that was the beginning of the end for me, honestly, is when I started to really listen to the sermons and really read the book. Because I read that change into his image. And I remember saying on Friday the 13th of July in 2007 to Stephen Jones and Gary Weir, have you read this book, Change into His Image? And Stephen said, No, I really can't get through it. <laughs> so they're not even reading it yet. Stephen even... Jones. Said I can't really get through that book. <laughs> Stephen Jones cannot get through. Oh. I I haven't gotten through it yet. I'm like seventy pages in. It's horrible. It um, is horrible. You need to have a friend afterward. You have a cup yeah, of tea because afterward or something. This is what I'm noticing through this book. Um, Jim Burke has all the answers. He knows everything. He's really getting you to mistrust yourself, your own reality. Yes. And making you believe that you are completely worthless. And it's, it is thought reform. Because as I'm reading this book, I'm reading a book on thought reform. And I'm like, these are thought reform techniques. And it's common in fundamentalism and in cults where they have to get you to mistrust yourself, believe, convince you that you're so worthless. And they make you reframe your past. 
if you maybe like smoked a little bit right. now you and now you see it as an addiction i was addicted to cigarettes i was so awful and then they get you to convince you how awful and worthless you are and break right. you down and then it goes to yeah and so you have to defer to him or yeah. whomever spiritual authority is yeah. Yes. And I haven't gotten through it yet, but that's what I'm seeing right now. He's setting the stage. And it's crazy because me dealing with religious trauma, it's really triggering because I grew up in fundamentalism. And then yeah. it started to make me doubt my own reality sure. completely. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. he's gaslighting us. I'm like, yes. Both. And the metaphors he uses, and I'm sure he hasn't taken these out, but he told me he sees himself as a campus cop. So he's the authority. He was the students at the time. He calls us God's pets. He says that in there. Oh, I'm no, that's not a biblical thing. We are not God's pets. You know, he realized that is really bizarre. I love my cat and I love my dog, but that is not a relation. That is not the kind of relationship. Parent is the relationship that, that the Bible uses. And gosh, he's again. It, it, always erasing the hum, humanity, always erasing autonomy, and being like passive and learn and having and, and resting and learned helplessness or so, stymied and learned helplessness. Yeah. So th this is something else I want to dig into because I've through the Surviving BJU podcast and even this one, and like people even thanked me for the Surviving BJU, which I was surprised by. They're like, "Oh, thank you for not." attacking christianity or jesus christ thank you for just which these were not bob jones people these were mm -hmm. just other people they're like thank you just for exposing this but it's interesting because then some people are like oh you just hate christianity so much That's it's just interesting the different reactions and it's okay i'm calling out manipulation course of control cult it's just interesting to me but something that has been claimed to be a part of christianity is this, which the, a lot of these fundamentalists believe is the worm theology, the complete, utter worthlessness, utter depravity. And something that stuck out to me that you said on Surviving BJU, I can't remember if I added it in or not. It was something, you had called that heresy. Yeah, we're not worthless pieces of shit. That's not biblical. I remember when my friend explained that to me. I, and I'm, I, God bless her. She is a good egg. But she said, no, we're not. That's not what that means. It means we're broken. We, we, we're not perfect. We're finite. We can't see the future. We can't see everything all at once. We can't not get sleep. We can't, yeah. that's what the brokenness means. We can't, we have to eat. We have you know, limits. We have, to, we have limits. Yeah. We're human. Yeah. And that's not, and we get sick and we hurt. We have right. mental illnesses. We exactly. Yeah. So that's the brokenness, but it doesn't mean we're worthless pieces of shit. It just means that we can't save ourselves. Yeah. Okay. And that's a very different emphasis than that one theology where, you know, you could, Jim Burke has to remind us that we're worthless pieces of shit. I hope it's okay for me to say shit over and over. Oh, it's totally fine. Okay. Okay. Because we're, he has to remind us of that because that's the way the whole thing rests on that yeah. idea. But I remember in the 80s when Bob Wood gave a sermon about the song by Whitney Houston, Greatest Love of All. Do you remember that song? It was. I, I don't know if I know it or not. Okay. She's saying, she's, um, she's got this, this great voice. And she's singing about how uh, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier, et cetera, et cetera. The greatest love of all is loving yourself. And boy, did he crash that sermon. That was just selfishness. That's not the greatest love of all. And the whole time, of course, I'm singing the song. You heard me just say the lyrics. I'm singing the song in my own head, thinking, no, humanly, this is how I, ha I have to start by a self-respect. I have to start with taking care of... Doesn't the Bible say, love your neighbor as yourself? Right. I got to put the, the 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 oxygen mask on myself first before I put it on the child in my care. That's just, that's the way it goes. And that's what she's singing about. So um, they hate that. They, yeah. they, they have to, even while Jim Berg is putting himself up as the, this authority, he's putting us all, putting the rest of us down. 
Yeah. And that is something I, I think, and it, it, it makes it so difficult also about making this podcast is that, and it's sad that these people believe that, oh, this is Christianity. Right. And this is the truth. This, you have to see it this way. And if you don't like it, and then you're just rejecting the truth then. There's a sense in BJU land, they reduce everybody to a will, to a binary on off. You're either doing the right thing or you're not. There are t- just two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. How about both? It's possible, yeah. right? Or maybe neither. Maybe I'm going to take this vitamin because it's, I don't really like it, but it's good for me. Is that pleasing God? Is that pleasing self? No, it's neither. Get over yourself. Yeah, not everything is a binary, but they do reduce us all to that either or. Either we're one or a zero, on or off. Yeah. So. Oof. Yeah, no, it's good because we're digging into the heresies of Bob Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love this. I wanted to dig into. But I also, before we get more into the heresies, I want to talk about any specific theological teachings or practices that distinguish it, but that distinguishes Bob Jones from other religious institutions or mainstream Christianity. Sure. So I, I've spent a lot of time talking with graduates from other institutions, other Christian institutions. And in some ways, you talk to somebody from Calvin, you talk to somebody from Regent, you talk to somebody from Liberty or Wheaton or Covenant. And, and a lot of times the life is very similar. There is a very, sim- there's a recent book out from my friend, Valerie Hobbs. That's some book, I tell you. And she's a Covenant grad and she describes a very familiar world. The difference, I think, between <laughs> all those other schools I mentioned and Bob Jones is this thoroughness that we were taught, how thoroughly we were taught that BJU is capital G good. I don't think Covenant grads and I don't think Wheaton grads have inculcated into them the same kind of loyalty that we were taught. There's this impenetrable aura of goodness that you described earlier in our conversation with from your uh, discussion with groups that of of alumni who like to think they're not with BJU anymore, but they will still defend it. Mm, That impulse, I don't think you see anywhere else. It reminds me of having that abusive parent, but not wanting to see it and idealizing them. Bingo. Yeah, yeah. That this we're taught that as students, the faculty well, reinforce it. They abuse me, but they did all these good things for me too. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. No, but it, no, but it's my husband at at Bob Jones. He's awesome. He's genuinely an awesome human being. I am very thankful for him. I love him the best. He's awesome. However. Darren Lawson's a jerk. I can, those two things could be true. Darren Lawson was very cruel to us. Other people were cruel to us too, but the place is cruel. But still, I still love my husband. He's an awesome person. But we're taught it's good. BJU is God's school. You see this, maybe you're not in the positive group, this recent uh, group of positive BJU. Oh, I was kicked out a while ago. Yeah, I've not been, I knew they wouldn't let me in, but I've got so many friends in there who are telling me all kinds of things. In case positives, you're listening, you're wondering how I'm getting all this data. Oh, boy, could, could you explain to people listening what the positive <laughs> okay. group is? Sorry. When news came out that Pettit, this was in December of 12, 2012, when news came out that Pettit's contract might not be renewed, Steve Pettit, the, at that time the president of BJU, might not be removed, renewed, excuse me, a group of BJU alumni coalesced to say, we're going to be positive about BJU, um, and we're going to positively say that we need to keep Pet- Steve Pettit. And they have assigned to themselves all kinds of authority. They had a gathering, alumni gathering at the Turkey Bowl or whatever, and they have a prayer thing, and they have a board, and they're all, they have a website, all this stuff, and they insist that they're being positive. But Every time they talk about BJUs, there's still this deference to its goodness. It's God's school. Maybe it's not. And you know, the world can go on without BJU. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and 
it, it, it is interesting because it's something with cults is that they make you believe that you're a part of something so special, so mm. elite, so exclusive. And you got that. I know you got that in chapel. I know. Oh, you, I oh yeah. Oh, yes. Most definitely. If and they just don't it, understand us. They're not part of us, whoever that is. And it feels it's exhilarating to feel like, oh, my gosh. I am a part of something that God has blessed. Oh, God has called this leader Bob Jones Sr. And I have gotten to be in his presence or influence of his institutions and his teachings. Yeah. And oh, uh, it's just in, in a lot of different cults. Like it's it yeah. feels so good. And you then there's yeah. that it religious, does feel good. that superiority that comes with that. Or, oh, look, good. I'm checking all the boxes. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm good. I'm good. And I'm part of this goodness. So it's going to go on, even if I'm not a part. See, these people that are just, that just got. And you believe you're changing the world for the better. <sighs> like you're part of this mission oriented mindset, a sense of urgency. Oh, we got to push them. My brother calls it the bojo centric theory of the universe. It's like, <laughs> there's the planets revolve around BJU. I remember when I was there, who was it? It was, it was after 9 uh, 11. The faculty saying at the lunch table, they've got their eye, those terrorists have their eye on Bob Jones University. You know, that if they're going to bomb over here, they're going to bomb us. Oh, you really think you're that important? Yeah, they do. I, mean, I think it's a very culty thing. Yeah. But I don't see that at with Covenant grads. I don't see that with Wheaton grads. I could be wrong. And then are there any other theological teachings, teachings or practices that you feel like distinguish it from other places? Yeah, I, that's the biggie. And it's like a separation, but it's a separation unto, it's not a separation from the world. It's a separation unto themselves alone. So that the, it's always circling the wagons. It's always coalescing to the center. And it's very narcissistic too, because we have the answer. We're the best. Why would you ever want to do anything different than being a part of us? Like yeah, why why would you want to go anywhere else? Yeah. And that's why there are a lot of reasons not to go to Bob Jones. There's many thousands of reasons. And it's probably why partly why they're they ex they still exist at all and and is equally why it, why it's going to deteriorate, especially with these recent changes that are about to happen. We'll see. Yeah. If they take pants away and from girls, the theater department away, etc. And yeah, they're going to destroy themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. I think I had messaged you. I was like, they would rather destroy that university. They would happily destroy that university saying, we stood strong to the end in all of our values and look at us. And right. it's, like a, it's like a martyrdom. Look, do you, re do you this... remember? That, and that's what he said. That's what did, the senior said. That he did. That's right. He said, if, if this school ever turns away, I hope God will let me have a break from heaven and come down and, and destroy it brick by brick. I remember Bob Jones III when I was there saying that if this institution strays away, and I think he was talking about the creed, he's, there's something that can happen where the university can be like shut down immediately. Right. I, I signed an agreement when I graduated that said, if the school ever strays, I will come to, to shut it down. I signed that. Now, after me, they changed it to, if the school ever strays, I will... I vow I will write it. I will write the ship. They, because <laughs> too many, but there's thousands of us who graduated who said that we will shut it down if it ever strays. I'm telling you, you've strayed a long time, but anyway. <laughs> you, but you can't make everybody who comes, in. this is my opinion, everybody who comes out of Bob Jones University who is criticizing it from the outside, we're the good kids. We were the kids that believed all that nonsense. Oh, yes, I know. It, Every and one of us. And it's interesting because some people who really didn't know me before, they're like, oh, they're like, I don't know how you made it in fundamentalism. You're such a rebel. You're, you're just speaking out. And I'm like, oh, no, I was not like that at all growing up. I was a perfect soldier, like fundamentalist right. Christian soldier for Christ. Like I was like the ideal, like I try to fit into that and it like broke me, but I try my best to do that. And it's no like... This is not until recently that I'd, like I've really been like this. Like, but it's still, in my opinion, it's still that strong sense of justice that's persisting. That you believed these are the rules, 
I'm going to follow these rules and, and things will be okay. When that didn't happen and I was being a good girl or good boy and it didn't happen, wait a minute, there's something wrong here because I believed this. It's those people that are milk toast about BJU who like defend it in a kind of a casual way like you have described. Those people, usually BJU has some dirt on them. And and one thing I noticed too with some of the people, like they have family that are heavily involved with it. And it's if they call it BJU, what does that mean about their family? Are they com- like they're complicit? Yeah. yeah. I know a particular if if you rise in the ranks at Bob Jones University, you usually rise in the ranks because you, something happened. And it may be something silly like you drank on campus. I'm not saying it's like you burned down a building. Okay. It, it's something similar, something mild. You smoked weed or something maybe more serious. It might be a crime. You wrote, you confess that to an authority and the authority said, okay, we'll forgive you. And, but they have that over you. So that allows you to, to rise in the ranks. Mm, yeah. I, I, that way, I, I, if they ever don't like you anymore, then they have something to use against you oh i see oh yeah we talked about the files and the surviving yes. bju the files like scientology oh, does oh my gosh oh yeah oh, oh. yeah oh, yeah Matsko, uh, and i i know he's listening Matsko likes to say that about me he's like yeah we have some files on her too and i'm like yeah i know you do i know what are in those files i got 11 demerits <laughs> but when we left our friend who was working for it at bju at the time said you're offices were like a crime scene they were convinced that they were going to find something on your computer they didn't find anything because there was nothing in yeah. but they were convinced that I, we had my husband and i both had been evil oh whatever that means yeah and that's what they want they want to people who are the outsiders to paint them as completely yeah. evil and then they want you to not trust anyone on the outside at all period Right. But yeah, regarding like the teachings and practices that distinguish it, mm-hmm. I think, okay, so in the great, I, in the notes that I had in the questions that I have for you, there's this quote from the Greenville News article that I've absolutely have loved so much. And it's the quote from the Greenville News article. And I'll link the article if people are interested in reading okay. the whole thing that you say in the article about Bob Jones University. You say, it's not the fact that Jesus has saved us that makes us able to live the Christian life. Lewis said, the message is you need to check all these boxes of righteousness in order for Jesus to save you, which is a whole different kind of Christianity. It's very human-centered, not Jesus-centered. I have a friend who said to me years and years, he's a good guy, who said to me years ago, when you're listening to a sermon, if you can replace whatever they say the ever say Jesus with Spider-Man and it still makes sense. You're not hearing about a savior. You're hearing about a superhero. So I've been, as I listen to and read sermons over the last century of fundamentalism, it is frightening how little Jesus is in there. He's just not there. He's a token that you carry. You can even, even down to the grammar Jesus is the object of the preposition. He or he's the receiver of the action. He's not doing the act. It's not Jesus saves as much as I am saved. And that's the, the way the grammar is. I my book started that I have right now, or narrowed, maybe I should say, when I was trying to track Bob Jones Senior's life. In Marshall, Texas, in night in the spring of 1924, oh my word, it's a hundred years ago. I just realized that because wow. it was right before it was right before Easter. Wow. Okay, so in the spring of 1924 in Marshall, Texas, the, it's just a little town. It's East Texas. It's right outside of Shreveport, Louisiana. They the newspapers, the evening newspaper and the morning newspaper, were competing for subscribers. So they each hired stenographers to transcribe every sermon that Bob Jones Sr. preached in those six weeks. So I have two copies from two witnesses of 42 sermons. And so I can see what he preached the whole time. 
Jesus is mentioned once. And it's, he is, Jesus is the subject of the sentence once. For 42 sermons of a six week campaign that claims to be an evangelistic campaign that claims orthodoxy, that claims to be the gospel, that's strange. Nearly every sentence starts with I, with Bob Jones Sr. as the subject. Yeah, I remember you told me he loved to make himself the hero of his yeah. own story. He is the the main character in his own novel, and oh, however you want to say it. Um, so Jesus is not, it, it's never about Jesus. In fact, if you look at the website, at Bob Jones, it's usually the they want a godly person. They want someone who, they want us to act Christ, Christ-like. So they're even making Jesus or God into an adjective or an adverb. The mission, our mission with students is to help them grow in Christ-like character. That's even, that's weird. God, it's just a weird phrasing. I have a sermon, I found it because I was thinking about it, uh, from Mount Calvary, which is a BJU Orbit church here in, in Greenville. One of the more hardline conservative ones. And in 2010, Mark Minnick was giving a sermon about music. And he was saying, it's this, this, there's so much for us to wrestle with in this world. There's so much, and we fail so often. So our only hope is that we live according to the Bible. This is how he ends it. Our only hope is that we live scripturally so that at the end of our lives, God will say, well done a good and faithful servant. Okay. That is not our only hope. That is absolutely not. Cause I'm, that is apps. And here's this guy and his reputation. I assume he's held up as like the premier oh, yeah. Bible teacher. Mm-hmm. He is it. He is better than all the rest. And he's not, he's preaching, not Christ. He's not preaching anything that resembles the good news. As, as my friend used to say, if it's not good news, it's not the gospel. It's got to be good news. And there is no good news in there at all. None. I got the gospel when I was at Bob Jones. I had the good news from the music. When we would sing Charles Wesley, we would sing those songs. That's what was the good news. It was not in the pulpit. There is no good news there because Jesus isn't there. Oh, Folk. And a lot of people don't question it and don't see it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't see it in fundamentalism when I grew up. But when I got yeah. out, I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, they really didn't, like, growing up in the IFB and then even at Bob Jones. Okay. Like, they didn't talk about Christ a lot. Uh-huh. And that's that's the. And like you said, they use him as a token. Oh, gosh. They yeah, did he... talk about him. Yeah. He's something you told. Or it's like a cross you wear on your, around your, in a necklace. Yeah, he's a tool to be used. Yeah, tool. Yeah, and the tool, oh, I hate that, but that's it. That's it. It's like he found a, a shovel in the or a broom in the garage, and he's going to tote him around. See, I'm cleaning the house <laughs> by waving Jesus around like that. Oh, so oh it's not orthodox. That's the funny thing, and then that's controversial for me to say, and people don't like that I say that. But it is an orthodox. There's a, okay, so the Nicene Creed was from the fourth century and it was from the Council of Nicaea and the St. Nicholas was part of that council. And what they were determining in that council is that Jesus didn't become God, meaning God the Father was looking around for somebody who was good enough to be his, the savior. And he landed on this, this baby or this person and then made him into God. No, that's not what happened. That's how the Mormons argue and that's how the Jehovah's Witnesses argue. That's Arianism. It's not that he was second, secondary of God. He was like a copy of God. No, the council at Nicaea said that Jesus is God of God. That's a big deal. Because in the clan arguments from the 20s and other popular Christian-ish arguments in the 20s you get that idea that jesus became god meaning he was he later it later happened and that is unorthodox um the the song o come all ye faithful has a 
verse that is a verse of the Nicene Creed. It's, so it's a musical version of it. We never sang that at Bumpkins. I always think that's strange. We never, I can get you the verse. I can look it up. But anyway, here, I'll look it up since we're just sitting here. Okay. God of God, light of light. Lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. Very God begotten, not created. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. That's the Nicene Creed that's establishing Jesus as God. And there's something, they're reticent or they're historically not as likely or something to affirm Jesus as God. So that's, it's a, it's suspicious. I think when you listen to Minnick, especially Minnick will say stuff like how I, I've heard him say this, how we have to be like God. We have to do what God would do. We have to see things from God's perspective. We have to um, mimic or imitate the character of God. We can't. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. And nor, he never wants us to do it. It's just, it, it's so, it's such a doesn't ridiculous that, doesn't thing. Doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of right. him dying on the cross? <laughs> That's why God got it. I'm not. That's basically the whole thing. And I can't, I can't be like God. I can't create life out of nothing. I can't live forever. I can't, I don't know everything. This is the whole point of being a human being. So it's weird. Minnick is especially unorthodox, even though he sounds like he's so serious, but he's especially dangerous. If you get a guest, sometimes you'll get a guest speaker at Bob Jones who will accidentally tell you the good news, but most of the time the people in their employ or in the orbit don't. And yeah, it's, it, it is interesting to me because a lot of people don't question that. I didn't question that for a long time sure. because you're taught that, oh, these spiritual leaders, they're called by God. They're speaking for God. And you trust, you have, you trust these people if a you lot. If you say it enough, you'll, you'll believe it eventually. That's true. That's yes, happens. that's exactly true. Yes. A hundred percent. Oh my God. Because it's easier to control people. If they're trying to reach this level of perfection, this state that they have. Absolutely. That's because you convince people there's nothing good inside of them. They have the answer. So you always have this shame and you're doing everything you can to overcome that shame. And they get you to con convince you all, all these things are horrible and they want you to confess, uh, go to a leader, confess all these things because they want to know you're like – they remember the Christian evaluation forms, just basically self-criticism, self-confessions, basically. And it's Those because – are awful. They're – oh, I remember I never filled one out ever. Good for um, you. I never did. I threw it away when it was given to me. And my RA, like you were technically never required, but it was expected and people would ask and check up on it. I'm not writing these things out, my thoughts and my feelings what they want you to do is that once you get to you confess to all these things then it's the re-education part the readjustment the realignment the discipleship the counseling the let's i know air <laughs> quotes sorry it's, yeah i know so many so air many. quotes and it's thought reform honestly it is it that is, is an app it's an apt yeah term for it yeah oh my gosh yeah brainwashing is another more extreme term to call it but <laughs> And it's hard to unravel that. I'm thinking of my friends who are facing. And I've thought of it too. Ahead. This, I, this, I can do these things. Mm -hmm. It gives, I think it gives people a sense of control. Right. I can be like God. And, and then that's, gosh, that's frightening for, that I even said it that way. Cause it sounds like, boy, it sounds creepy, but that he is especially pernicious. Minix stuff because it's always we've got to do we've got to be what god is we've got to and he'll say it a little more subtly than that the way i've heard evangelicals critique this is to, not to say what would jesus do or what would god do but what would jesus have me do you know what that's a different phrase that's a mm -hmm. what would god want me to do in this situation i'm not supposed to be like god because i can't see things from god's perspective i don't know what he would do what am I going to do? I'm going to be a human being and treat people mm. with kindness. So that's yeah. how I, that's how that means for me. Yeah. So if I'm invited to a wedding, I go to a wedding and I can go, I go to a wedding, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, but yeah, something else I wanted to get into with really 
some of the teachings that distinguish them is i think it's is it you say it's oh, in, oh ennis david ennis, ennis. david yes. ennis you his... don't know him <laughs> no um, so he was on the board for a long time he's a pastor out in san francisco and has been there forever and ever and i've been to his church and back when i was a employee his daughter was my husband's music student he preached a sermon on separation in the 90s and i have the handout that i gave to you whenever that was and it's because my first book was about bj's expression of separation i tune in deeply to whenever that trope comes up and when you look at it it is utterly bizarre it makes no sense i don't think outside of his own head or to anybody if you look at that handout and i can call it up right now but if you look at that handout it doesn't make I'm going to call it up. It doesn't, it's, it seems to be only in his own head, I think. Now, Ennis, David Ennis is in, he's in San Francisco. And in the 90s, a group of LGBTQ folks protested his guest, a guest speaker that was at his church. And he got all kinds of propping up for standing strong against those protesters it was in 1992 here it is he was having a homophobic evangelist named lou sheldon and oh it was such a big deal for them hamilton square baptist church i can get you more data but this night this 94 sermon so it was right after that and we listened to the the protest on audio recording in chapel right after it happened, because it was proof that of the martyrdom of Christians in, in the United States. So he came to Beach Daniels Chapel to explain this. And if you look, it just makes no sense. I'm looking at it now. He's got this handout with lines drawing everywhere about what's orthodox, what's neo-evangelical, what's fundamentalist, what's liberal, and how we determine could all you, these different... I don't... Could you, share, could you share what he taught about separation? That commands concerning love and unity don't apply to fundamentalists. That separation is more important than love. That we have to, I'm, I'm summarizing here, we have to obey, period. That a fundamentalist will separate from either unbelievers or believers who violate fundamental truths or commands of scripture. So if you are not us, you have to separate from whatever that is. Whatever that in-group is, you separate. He says a fundamentalist is, a, is one who believes and obeys everything that is clearly taught in the scriptures. All that is clearly taught, whether for belief or conduct, is fundamental and therefore essential to the Christian faith. We can't. That's the whole point. We can't obey. It's one thing to believe, because that's a metaphysical thing, mm -hmm. but we can't obey everything. That's the whole point. We can't do it. Jesus did it. Yeah. So see, there's that mix again that, that we have fundamentalists obey everything in scripture. Okay. That's impossible. All right. That's the point. So that's why we need someone to do it for us. But what he then ends up doing is saying, I'm a fundamentalist. I obey everything God says. So whatever I'm doing, he reasons backwards. So whatever I'm doing must be obedient. And it must be of God. He's, and he's making himself into God. Because he doesn't need Jesus because we're the ones that have to obey everything. It's, that's how it's very pernicious. Oh. Does that make sense what I'm saying? That does make sense. He says here, a fundamentalist takes seri seriously the clear command to love his bre brethren and to promote biblical unity among his brethren. But you have to separate first, then you love second. So if I And see, that's not love. No. And like, that's why that's not like, love at all. And that's what is like blown my mind, like getting out is that it's just the conditional. Bro, oh, it's very, yeah. And you love who's inside. And so these people who are recently pushed out of Bob Jones, the, the, my friends, they're, got, they're at a crossroads and probably they're going to choose to somehow stay connected to the powers that be. Because that's where they have found their identity and their sanctification and their righteousness instead of exiting the, the, into the big wide world and finding out that it's not as scary as they thought. Yes. It's not scary. Either. It's not. It's not scary. No. 
I know that's a lot. So I think that I've capitalized on, I, I yeah. think I've explained it. Yeah, but, you have. But, but something I'm separation curious. Separation is paramount. Then love. Of course, then you're only loving those that are inside the in-group. You're not loving the out-group ever. You would never do that because they're wrong. Mm. First, you separate. Yeah, and it's interesting because some would argue that they are loving them. By separating. I, yeah, by separating. Yeah. Uh, because but, then, if you, then they'll learn that this is where righteousness is and you need to come over here. Then they'll learn. Yeah. And, and they are really, they really do believe that if they make that clear, then people will be drawn to them because of their righteousness. They really do believe that. Is there such thing as like a biblical kind of separation? What a great question. As an individual, never. I can't think of any reason to do that. Mm -hmm. unless, unless you're thinking like, this friend is a toxic friend and I have to yeah. remove I mean, like, myself from this situation. In, like in teachings, like growing up, I always heard, oh, we separate from unbelievers. That's like this, the, right. the start. Bob Jones takes it a lot farther in separating from any, literally even other believers who believe oh, yeah. even slightly tiny things differently yeah. than you. They take it yeah. really far. But what is like biblical separation from like unbelievers? Is that such a thing? Yes, that's a great question because I, now you're blowing my mind a little bit because I'm trying to think what I have heard in conservative evangelical, I, I, I identify as an evangelical. That word is getting less and less used. And so I, when I use it, I know I'm doing it strategically. Mm -hmm. I know that. Because <laughs> it's interesting because by Jesus... I'm messing with people when I do Yeah. <laughs> by Jesus' example, like he loved and cared for people. He did not do the example of separation at uh -uh. all. Oh, no. In fact, he said, it's not what goes into you that contaminates you. It's what comes out of you. And basically, he's saying, it's your own poop that contaminates, not the food you're eating. So don't think that you can have clean food. It's your own poop that's contaminating. It's your own product. You contaminate. So holiness for Jesus is catchy. Not, not the world isn't going to contain. We, we are the ones that are tainted in and of ourselves with our brokenness, but if you look at Christ's teaching, it's holiness that's catchy. Um, Interesting. Yeah. That's why he did hang out with publicans and sinners. That's why he was... I don't... I can understand, though, why a person might say, look, this friendship is not good for me, and I'm going to yeah. take a break. That's some healthy boundaries that we learn when we're in therapy. I didn't, wouldn't call that separation. And I don't, uh, the sermons I have heard since I've left Bob Jones about separation have used, what's that called? That, that Edgar Allan Poe story, the cask of Amontillado, cast of Amontillado, short story Uh huh. here, which is a story about a person who builds a wall around himself and dies in the cylinder of brick because he was so separated from the world. That's how I hear now about separation, that, it's gonna, that we are not called to separation. We are called to sociability. We are called to being with each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. So that's a complete opposite. That's a complete opposite of anything. The cask of Montiado. That was the example that a pastor used in my current church to say this is the this is what happens with separation it kills you mm. cuz we're not called to be walled off from other human beings yeah such an opposite it's such an opposite thing and that's and not like in the, some it is against our own nature like we're naturally collect into different groups and interact yeah. and de depend that like interdependence too so it's just good point yeah, yeah. you're right tribalism that is what we do yes that's what the that's what the story of jonah is all about it's not about a literal fish swallowing a man that is completely misunderstood it's about nationalism jonah was being a jerk mm -hmm. to people who weren't like him that's the point but god was mad at him for being a nationalistic prophet that was the whole point again it's not about the fish it's about yeah. jonah's 
pride is nationalism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, sorry. No, it's all good. I had to go off on it for a bit. It's all good. So the next thing I want to dig into is how does Bob Jones University interpret and understand the Bible? Which is that a big, is funny. Big question. We, I said earlier that it is a tool, that it does seem like it's a, a member of the Trinity. So they do idol, uh, idolize it. I use that word. But yet they don't read it either. <laughs> That's so bizarre. And it's interesting because I, what I feel like a lot of these, what happens is they're taught to read these books by all these different pastors and theologians who see it this one way, this fundamentalist way, and they, you're in, they're indoctrinated to see it one way, and they can't see it outside of that narrow set of lens. And they're constantly like re, being reinforced, hearing the same thing over and accepting that as truth and not questioning that. And when I got the message, the Bible version of the message, and I read Galatians in the message, and I read Jeff Van Vondren's book, Tired of Trying to Measure Up, which is about Galatians, that's when I realized this fundamentalism is nothing but Pharisee, Pharisees. It's a bunch of Pharisees. This is the mission field. This place is godless. This place has, they're not, I read the Bible and realized they don't teach this. And the joke around you fill in whatever denomination you want, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian. But in my iteration is a Presbyterian is just a Baptist who learned how to read. And that is the truth. I've read Galatians and saw my own self-righteousness in that book and that Paul was talking to me. And when my husband, my darling, darling husband brought that up to Stephen Jones and Gary Weir and said, have you read Galatians? Have you read it? Because if that's if we're going to take that seriously, Paul says that your own self righteousness or your own circumcision, I would rather you cut it off. I'd rather you be a eunuch than tout your own righteousness. And Stephen Jones actually said, and I quote, "Galatians was written for a particular time and place and doesn't apply to today." And we asked him later. We said, "Wait a minute. I thought we were fundamentalists." I thought that the bold thing, but the Bible is it, right? I thought that was it, but they don't see it that way. The Bible is a tool, even though they idolize it, it's a sacred tool for the powers that be to wield it whichever way they want. When Stephen Jones said that on Friday the 13th of July in 2007, it was over for us. We can't. Wow. I can't. I'm sorry. I do believe the Bible. I really do. And I'm still, even though... I'm not quite, I'm not a fundamentalist anymore. I do believe it. I'm still a, a Christian and I can't abide by your, and like, seriously. Isn't that like just the cognitive dissonance? I don't. Just, I saw the look on your face like, but that's not it. The, Bi- the Galatians doesn't apply to t- today. Because they love to apply so many things to us. There yeah. are all these different scriptures. But the, the, that's the thing though. When it, when you use, when when it challenges their authority and their teachings or the way that, that their own Bingo. teachings, then... Yeah, when it gets too close. In the same meeting, they yelled at me because I said somewhere on a blog, this is so ridiculous, Christian liberty rocks. That's what I said. Uh, what was my sentence? Christian liberty rocks. They got mad at that. Pat Burke found it somewhere. And she went up the chain the food chain and they brought that up too they didn't like that because it's what an interesting contrast because what galatians is basically saying is you have liberty and then they're like no we can't control people with that so no we don't like that bingo we don't like that we can't control manipulate no (laughs) that's it we can't have that power and control yeah oh gosh Okay. Uh, wow. That, that, that's a good yeah. a specific instance of like how BJU does approach that. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Is there anything else you want to say to that question? I think that's basically it that yeah. I had here. Okay. That, that the Bible is a weapon for them and it is intended to defend the powers that be. And that's, it's not really for ordinary people to find solace and comfort. And, and like, that's the thing that I noticed when I went to Bob Jones was if you're right with God, you're going to s- interpret it and see it exactly as all these leaders say it. And if you don't have the same convictions, you're not right with God. They're not yeah. the problem. You're the problem. Yeah. And th- they would talk about it, Bob Jones, 
cultivating a relationship with Jesus, which is looking back, I'm like, you what, what? It's weird. What did they think? I don't know what they mean by that. Yeah. And so that was my next question. It's like, what is their approach to cultivating a relationship with Jesus? What does that look like to them? I don't, that's a really great question. I remember sitting in a meeting where I was getting yelled at by Darren Lawson and others. And my friend said, being friends with you hurt my, paralyzed my Bible reading and my spiritual condition. And I said, what? You can't say that. I said that exactly. You can't say that. I'm not responsible for your prayer life, your Bible reading, your spiritual condition. That's your business. I, I just said, you can't say that. And she threw up her hands, looked at Lonnie Polson, who was sitting next to her, and said, see, I can't talk to her. Based on that instant, you cultivate a relationship with Jesus, your prayer life, Bible reading, and spiritual condition, by having relationships within the in-group, not without the out-group, because I was already on the way out. Yeah. And so that was hurting her spiritual, whatever that means, her spiritual condition, her relationship with Jesus. That's how you do it. You maintain the walls, you build that tunnel, mm. that silo, yeah. so you're protected from the outside world. Uh, so that's how I think you, I, that's how I think I would describe that. Okay. Does that make okay. sense? That does make sense. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. And I think the next thing is we both know, we talked about this a lot. Authority is such a big deal mm -hmm. and fundamentalism. And so could you really explain the role of authority and also the teachings around authority and BJU, which is really like typical throughout fundamentalism? When I had that meeting with Jim Berg in the Atlanta Bread Company in Cherrydale, he said something like, and this fits with the rest of his writing. So he was saying it to me directly, but it, it's not a surprise. He saw himself as a middle manager. His job was to obey the administrators above him on the food chain and to get the people below him on the food chain to obey him. In a sense, it's all this like an org chart of authority, but he saw himself as like a, a stopgap of obedience. He was responsible for all the people below him to obey him, and he was only to obey the people above him. It was all, again, just obey, not think, not love, not get your hands dirty, not whatever else. We could put so many verbs there, mend, feed, nurture, give a cup of water to, not that. You just obey the people ahead of you, uh, above you, and then make the people below you obey. And that's it. You make the people below you obey, which fits with your observation about the, the book, The Change Into His Image. It's just thought reform. Yeah, it is. It thought, like, yeah, it is. And isn't that weird? The recent stuff about uh, that from the sermons that they've had for the seminary, where they'll talk about depressed people. When they're talking about depressed people, they're never talking to depressed people. The, the speaker presumed that the people in front of them were not depressed and never had been. It's those people out there. It, so that if you are depressed, you're not in the group. It's convenient. Okay. And then is there anything else we want to say about authority? No. Again, like I told you earlier, the, when Bob Jones starts every sentence in Marshall, Te nearly every sentence in Marshall, Texas with I, you get the, it's a very self-centered, yeah. egocentric mm -hmm. ethic. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And it's just, and again, when you make these things sacred, you cannot question it. You're taught, oh, they, they represent God and we have to obey. And you could, you hold a lot of power with that. And we've seen a lot of horrible things happen with that. The Shining Happy People documentary, the Let Us Pray docuseries and all that. And we're seeing the fruits. Yeah. We're seeing the fruits of it. It's not good. Sphere. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It is scary because like really what I talked about in the Surviving BGU podcast is we looked at like the world of Bob Jones University, but they want that on a large scale for our country. There's a group of people called the Council for National Policy, I think it's called. It was started by Tim LaHaye, super secret evangelical organization. Stuart Epperson was a member when he was alive. He was a BJU grad. Yeah. And Tim LaHaye, of course. Do James Dobson was part of it, et cetera. 
Bob Jones, I think, really wanted to be a part of that. He was on the on that council for two or three years in the nineties, I think it was. But that they do want that's they want to control the Congress. <laughs> they do. Yeah. And it's pretty right now that guy in the House of Representatives seems pretty fundamentalist approved. So. Oh my gosh. This is really scary, this this upcoming election. Yep. And it, it's just if and it's something I'll dig more into probably later on the, in these podcasts in general, but like they're just and, and like Robert J. Lifton, uh he's a psychiatrist who studied brainwashing in China. Oh, but yes. He, oh, yes, yes, yes. Anyways, he has his book, so I think, or he has said this phrase of something like destroying the world to save it. And this is just something he's seen a lot in these extremist groups and cults is that there's is always this there's this fear of, oh, this group, they're going to destroy, they're going to take over everything. So we have to take over. We have to dominate. We, and in a sense, they end up, they're like a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're destroying the, the world, yeah. the institution to save it. And doesn't it, to be really Sunday school about it, it sounds a lot like the Tower of Babel because that they're building themselves up to God. And we all know what happened. God Ooh. was really pleased with that. It's not going to work. Yeah. But I anyways. How, I don't know how many uh, people are going to die before it, it doesn't work, but it's it, it seems like they're setting themselves up for failure. Mm. That, that's not good. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I went on a t- tangent there, but that's um, okay. I love tangents. <laughs> but you know, the next question that I had, how does, and you maybe, I think, yeah, you have touched on this a little bit, a little but bit. I don't know if you want to go further, but how does the university address topics as creationism, biblical inerrancy and biblical literalism? So I've mentioned before, you don't have to live really very long in fundamentalism to see a change in how fundamentalists talk about creationism. Ken Ham has really locked down the idea of being a young earth creationist in fundamentalism. You have to be. I remember in the 80s when Bob Jones Jr. would get up and preach about or, or identify himself as a gap theorist. I remember him saying that members of the science faculty were from a wide range of creationists. They were old earth creationists, young earth creationists, Etc. And that had to change when they got tracks accreditation. So they had to be solely and only committed to young earth creationism, which is relatively new. That's a, such a silly thing to, that's only what, maybe 120 years old? It's not very old. So it's such a silly thing. Now, they've always been inerrantists. They believe the Bible is inerrant. They always have been literalists. The literalism comes from common sense Scottish realism. In other words, in, in Scotland, there's this idea that, or in the 18th century, that if I see something, you know, the obvious thing is probably the true thing. It's whatever is commonsensical is probably factual. So that's how they read the Bible. They don't read it deeply. They read it on the surface, which is also a new thing. That's a very new, a very recent change. John Calvin was not an Aaronist. Okay. When you think about it, that's weird to consider that even the people that they honor Mm -hmm. didn't have these ideas. John Calvin said that the Bible was God's baby talk, that it was God's way of talking to humans, mere humans. So it's not going to be an errand. And it can't be taken literally. The first chapter of Genesis is poetry. This has never been intended to be taken that way. So that's my, that was Camille's view. But it is historically a a, a recent, variation but all of those creationism inerrancy and literalism Mm -hmm. their mindset in that is so inflexible that's a core part of fundamental fundamentalism is an inflexible Mm -hmm. mindset because you know there there are obviously things in scripture that are there are some things that are literal and there are things that are obviously not obviously obviously supposed to be obvious (laughs) your poetry that's or whatever it's about parable is not to be taken literally. Yeah. But Jesus is doing that right there, but they, they take it literally when they want to take it literally. Mm-hmm. And they take it figuratively. If you ever want to be have a, a good time with them, talk about Song of Solomon, because they don't want to take that one literally at all. 
They don't yeah. want to see it as a love story between a man and a wife. They want to see it as a picture, a, figuratively, as a picture of Christ and the church. I don't know that that's really what it is. But okay, we'll run with what you're saying now. <laughs> All right. Uh, what they don't do is Daniel, the book of Dan. But anyway, they don't take <laughs> Daniel literal at all, but that's okay. But no, it's like another question I just thought of. I don't know if I'm going to answer it or not, but like it, it, with fundamentalism, there was a pamphlet of fundamentals in the 1920s yes. that really started. And a lot of people have said that the fundamentalists today aren't really fundamentalists or, or, or they're just taking it too far. What are your thoughts on that? I would I probably agree with that. If you look at those pamphlets, they were several volumes. I think there were 12. There's a lot. Mm -hmm. And they were hitting the highlights of the day that people were talking about. The virgin birth, things we still hear about. The inspiration of the Bible. And most of the time, those books ended up in YMCA's around the country. Oh, which is funny because they were so they were like encyclopedias mm -hmm. that you, and they were long, but they were started by not religious people, not theologians, not pastors. They were a couple of oil magnets, rich men, entrepreneurs that wanted to use some money to to help the church. Oh, so is that? And it's weird. It was just a businessman thing. It wasn't a a lofty spiritual goal or whatever. They were just making some money. Oh, okay, gosh, because <laughs> I could send you. I have a, I, yeah. I have the sources on that. If you, interested. yeah, it wasn't as lofty as that. And then mm -hmm. they, it was first the term was these are the fundamentals, and then gradually by the thirties they started to talk about fundamentalism, and then of course fundamentalists then developed after that. Now you don't have people using that word at all. Now they talk about biblicists. I have a friend who pointed out to me that the certain Muslims call themselves Quranists, hmm. which is funny because so they've taken it's it's another iteration of the term. We got fundamental fundamentalists, biblicists, Quranists, uh -huh. instead of Muslims wanting not wanting to call themselves fundamental Muslims. I think it's funny. I know there are. The fundamentalists today who would then argue and say, oh, we they say we're bad because we believe in these fundamentals. And it's no, that's, mis mm -mm. that's misrepresenting mm -mm. the whole argument. And we talked the about deeds, this earlier. Deeds, deeds, not the creeds. And fundamentalism is, it, it can take on in so many different belief systems. It's not just a part of religions. Like there are, are it could be, there's fundamentalism in politics. Like we've yeah. seen that oh, a yeah. lot. Yeah, and, and they know the the term has been used for yeah the it's in the, in the yeah, yeah yeah it it is an approach and a mindset to an ideology, and it turns very ugly, very quickly. Yeah, because um, yeah. you got to hold up the ideas or the ideology over the the people. And it's interesting because people then and we talked about this earlier before we recorded that people said to me, oh, like BJU, oh, it's not a cult because they preach. They preach the truth. It's the truth. And when you're in these high control groups, you're indoctrinated to believe that cults are only groups that have false teachings. And that's it. When reality and cult experts agree, again, like you had said, it's about, it's not about the creeds, it's about the deeds. Mm -hmm. It's about manipulation, deception, coercive control, just absolute control over a person's life. And, and there are other different elements involved. And it's about the relationship with the leader has with their followers and that control that they have. And there's also a weird in, in that creates this weird refusal to accept responsibility for actions. Yeah. Not just by the authority, like with the grace report, Jim Bird refused to take responsibility, continues to refuse to take yeah. responsibility for his actions. It's, he can't confess his own sin because then his whole world will fall apart. His mm -hmm. house of cards, his righteousness yeah. will fall. Mm -hmm. There can be places that are doctrinally sound, but they have that course. They have that high control over yes. their followers, with their charismatic or authoritarian leader that isolates them, and there are other elements. So it's it's a what's it called a, a red airing or whatever. It's a distraction. Red herring. Red yeah, herring. it is a distraction. A yeah. distraction. Exactly right. Yeah. Yes, a distraction it's, from the argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyways, but just, I just wanted to cover exactly that because right. so many people, I, I've gotten that a lot. Oh, they preach the truth. Like that's their rebuttal. 
Okay. And they they preach they assume they re- preach the truth because they say we preach the truth. <laughs> yeah. If you ask them if they've actually listened. Yeah. You don't have because I've listened. <laughs> Sorry, I really have listened, and that's yeah. why we had the. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then I know the last thing that mm-hmm. I had on my list was related to. And we we touched on this a little bit too, is like the university stance on like social issues such as Mm -hmm. LGBTQ rights and gender roles. It all they're always deferring to the power. Whatever the power is, they're all it's always that. So I know I was a threat when I was there because I described my marriage as egalitarian. They didn't like that. I was changing my son's diaper in the it was summer, it was hot, and I was changing my son's diaper in the fine arts sidewalk there. I went to the van because it was easy to change him in the van. And Pete Davis, a member of the piano faculty, confronted me and said, so-and-so says you have a, you describe your marriage as egalitarian. And I'm like, I'm holding the stinky diaper and my child, whatever. Yes, Pete, I describe my marriage as egalitarian. And he was like, that's not right. And he took it up with what he perceived as my authority, which was my chair of the department at the time, DeWitt Jones. And Grant and I and Pete and DeWitt Jones all had a conversation because Grant and I have an egalitarian marriage. That's odd. I was a threat because I had short hair. I was a threat because I just described myself as a feminist. I was even a threat. And here's what's so hilarious, because I breastfed my babies. I was like, I thought I was supposed to be a mom. I thought that was what you guys wanted. Not really. <laughs> they just Anything that was not... I, that was out of their control they didn't like yeah and um yes i this is probably going to be a common thing probably in every single episode but like i've talked about this with other survivors difference equals danger or difference is oh, demonic yeah. difference good. is of the devil yeah any difference any, any calling point. attention to yourself yeah is a problem I was like, I thought you wanted me to, me to be a mother. I thought that's what the ideal was. And I was, Oh, no, but not that way. Not our, that way. Our way. Yeah. And I loved being a mom. I love it. I still do. I just Babies are just the most awesome humans on the planet. And so I am all in like that. And as for the LGBTQ folks, I do remember yeah. my gay students very well. I knew they were, I knew they were gay. Yeah, I think they knew that. I don't know because you didn't talk about it. It was almost like you couldn't talk about it because you didn't want to put them at risk. Yeah, but one young man is a dear. He's a good guy. He's just a great guy. Shipped. Oh. I don't know why he got shipped. I didn't ask. By the end of my life there, I was like, I don't need to know why you got shipped. But he got shipped, and he came back, and he was sitting in my office. He was a great guy. He is a great guy. And he said something like, I want to get a master's degree in English here at Bob Jones. And I was like, why? And I didn't say why, but I just said, no, you need to go. You need to leave. And I was thinking, you need to go where it's safe for you. Yeah. Um, and I heard those stories from my friends who had masculinity classes. Oh. Did you hear? Did they do that in your time? So the I... uh, young man who was not what they perceived to be heterosexual acting whatever that means would have masculinity classes with tony miller oh i interviewed someone on surviving bdu and they had to meet with someone about okay. their masculinity i don't know if they called it classes but it was like a mentorship or okay. discipleship okay. type thing. okay discipleship but I, and and the same thing i call it as an outsider yeah and then there are all those boston marriages it's a 19th century term that came from, I think, a Henry James novel, if I'm remembering correctly. And in the 19th century, women would realize that if they got married, they would lose all their social and civil power. So they would refuse to get married. Okay, I get it. But what they do is take up a companionship relationship mm-hmm. with another woman. And they... the historians presume that it really isn't a sexual relationship or a romantic relationship. It's a romantic relationship. It is sexual, but it's really not. It's one of those weird things. And Henry James called those Boston marriages. There are all kinds of Boston marriages at Bob Jones. All kinds of women, they buy houses together. They vacation together. They are companions in every sense of the 
social world uh-huh. and BJU just turns their head and doesn't ask any questions. There's all kinds of those. We all knew it. I had never I heard about I this. What to, I don't know what, to, it's so funny because I was just, I have a um, colleague at Sermon who recently joined the staff and she and I were talking about this. She, she said the same thing. She's much younger than I am, but she said the same thing. She said, yeah, we all knew that they were a couple, right? But I'm like, yeah, I think we all knew they were a couple. But nobody talks about it. And I don't, yeah. so the polite 19th century term is a Boston marriage. No. Oh. And I don't know why, maybe it's because they're women, they get a pass. Yeah. And they presume that women aren't sexual. Oh, that could be. That old fashioned idea. Yeah. It might be it, but we all know it. <laughs> I could name them, but I'm not gonna, because <laughs> bless them. Oh my god! I know something else I want to dig into is like complementarianism. It's the uh, Bob Jones. They claim that oh, when women and men are equal, but they have distinct roles. Could you? Yes, explain- that's a that's a, such a funny little idea, isn't it? Because it's just patriarchy. It's just patriarchy with a new word. Yeah. But the the term roles, even that term, and again, you're talking to a rhetorician here who goes down to the the granular level with words. The term role didn't really enter the conversation in Protestantism until 1977. I can't remember the guy's name, but that's that he introduced it to our conversation with the feminist movement. Now, the Mormons were using that term before that, which is it seems as I look at the 20th century, it seems that we evangelicals, because of our political associations with anti-feminists, in the Mormon church, and there was a strong anti, anti-feminist anti strain that the language filtered over into our camp. And so that's when we started to talk about that there were women's roles, men's roles. It's the role isn't, it's, there's no roles. There are no roles in scripture. There's no role. I don't know. What, I mean, it means nothing. It's, it, there's no role. We're all commanded to be kind. That's not a man thing or a woman thing. We're all committed to, to not lie. That's not a man thing or a woman thing. It's just, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. So it's a reaction to the feminist movement from the 70s. And I, again, I don't describe my marriage as complementarian. It doesn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. We're, if the way I say it is that if Grant and I have a decision to make, and I'm, I'm talking like buying a new dishwasher, that kind of a decision. If we have a decision to make, we defer until both of us agree. So we make no decision until both of us agree, or we go with the, each person's expertise. So if we need a new lawnmower, I don't have any expertise in that. I don't know anything. That's not my business. So that's his business. So I defer to his judgment on that. But if we are deciding whether or not to breastfeed our children, that's my expertise. That's not, Grant doesn't have anything to say about that. That's my expertise. So I used to use that example in class. And the preacher boys were always like, <laughs> they couldn't quite know what to say. But I'm like, come on, my husband has no knowledge of that. Yeah. But it's a really important thing. It is a really important thing. So um, I think complementarianism, I, I think all good marriages, no matter what they call themselves, if they call themselves complementarian, really egalitarian that's my opinion that all good marriages look the same okay <laughs> that, that you defer and you consult each other it's not that hard it's not I mean, you, remember, you, yeah mm-hmm. you remember I, I think you probably heard this there has to be somebody in charge yes i heard that a lot it doesn't no it doesn't it's not that big a deal sorry there's it's not that big a deal yeah and again it's wanting that power hate and it has to go to the boys there down yeah. oh wow yeah, we have covered a lot. Yeah, and yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. I've enjoyed talking to you. You're a really good interviewer and a good conversationalist. Oh, thank you so and much. You're, you're, you listen well and you're tender and you're disarming. Oh, thank you so you're much. Awesome. But is there anything else you would like to say about the teachings of theology of Bob Jones? Any uh, thoughts? If you're frustrated by the ideology at BJU, it's for good reason. It's because you're a logical tender, kind person, and there are much better 
ideas outside of Bob Jones University. That's my thesis statement. Awesome. But yeah, thank you so much sure. again for coming on and just sharing your wisdom and all of the knowledge thank you. that You're you've welcome. accumulated. Oh, I've enjoyed course. talking to you. Oh, yeah. So for people listening, thank you sure. for listening to this episode of Beyond BJU. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond BJU. If you are listening on Apple Podcast or on Spotify, if you could leave a five-star rating, this will help other listeners just like you discover the show. Thank you.